morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm uh, happy to see you, and I'm uh, very happy to um, welcome our vice rector for research here at the University of Innsbruck, Professor Ulrike Danzer, and she will open this uh, conference. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the rectorate of the University of Innsbruck, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here in Tyrol. I hope everyone had a pleasant journey and that some of you already had the opportunity to spend some time in our city or its spectacular surroundings. And thanks to the organization, today is the first brilliant weather. Yeah? Today's beautiful venue is the so-called Kaiser Leopold Saal, named after one of the founders of our university, Emperor Leopold I of Habsburg. We find ourselves in the former Jesuit college and therefore in one of the oldest buildings of our university, which was founded 351 years ago. I don't always know our exact age, but we celebrated our 350th anniversary last year, so it's still quite simple to tell you how old we are. We are proud of more than 350 years of inspiring research and teaching, 350 years of visions, ideas, and continuous advancements in the heart of the Alps and in the heart of Europe. However, we are also seized the occasion of our anniversary to take a look into the future, to rethink and reshape the role of research and universities. Like our university, today's conference takes a look into the past and into the future. 14 partners from all over Europe carried out research within the consortium of the REIT project that was funded by the European Commission with 8 million euros from 2016 to, to 2019. The very ambitious goal of the project was nothing less than revolutionizing access to handwritten documents. One of the most notable characteristics of this project was not only its outstanding quality of basic research, but also the fact that the service platform called Transcribus was developed. The success of this effort exceeded all expectations. Recognition rates are much better than hoped for. The platform is now fully functional and actually used by thousands of users and some of the users are here from this more than thousand. As I said, past, present and future are linked by this project and its outcomes by modern means of digitization, automated recognition, transcription and searching routines users engaged in the transcription of printed or handwritten documents are now able to carry out research on historical texts on a completely different level. The University of Innsbruck was the co-ordinator of the REIT project. Due to its tremendous success, the idea for a spin-off emerged. Together with the project team, the university engaged in this experiment and founded a so-called European Cooperative Society. It is great to see that already more than 30 institutions have joined so far, and we are very optimistic that this success story will go on. Today's conference with 150 attendees from 26 countries is an impressive proof of the quality and relevance of Transcribus. There are people from archives, from libraries, from universities and companies attending this conference. It is obvious how important Transcribus is for many different user groups. I thank you all for coming to Innsbruck, for sharing your thoughts, scientific insights and findings on this very important topic. In particular, my thanks go to the organizers headed by Dr. Günther Mühlberger from our university and my special thanks also are to Johanna Walcher and Tamara Terbull and I would say we give them a special applause for all the work they have done to organize this conference.
Thank you and all your project partners for your enormous efforts in the past years within the REIT project and for making this conference in Innsbruck possible. And I hope you all enjoy your stay in Innsbruck. I wish you an inspiring and successful meeting. Yes, thank you, Ulrike. This was very, um, yeah, heartwarming. <laughs> it's also a great pleasure for me to say thank you. I have, uh, first of all, to say, uh, say thank you to you for coming to Innsbruck. Some of you really took a long travel from Canada, from, uh, I think someone came even from Japan, from uh, the US, uh, Great Britain, Finland. So really, thanks for coming. Also, thanks to all who are representing one of the co-op members. I think um, about 30 people in the room are somehow connected to institutions or are uh, personally members of the co-op, so that's really great. I also would like to say thank you to all the partners of the REIT project. The REIT project has ended half a year ago, uh, and more than half a year ago, but uh, it was really a great pleasure. And without the support and the trust of these partners, uh, neither the technology nor this um, legal entity would have come into being. So thanks again for this. And I also have to say, of course, thank you to the team. Uh, Tamara and uh, Johanna already have been mentioned, but there are uh, many people behind Transcribus, as you may know, have seen from the emails. So thank you for the team. Uh, members uh, Philipp, Sebastian, Berthold, uh, Florian, Andy, of course, and, and others. Uh, so great to work together. What has this nice guy to do with Transcribus? There is a funny story from Spain. People were looking for treasures and uh, some colleagues from Belgium made a nice video, which some of you might know, but um, not all of you will know this video, so I would like to show it to you. Historical archives contain a treasure trove of information. In filing cabinets, boxes and folders you can find vast amounts of old maps, letters, monuments and other often handwritten archival documents. To still be able to see the forest for the trees, archivists create global descriptions of the contents of those cabinets, boxes and folders. Those descriptions of the inventory can easily be searched online at home from your comfy chair. But sometimes a description is not enough. Instead you'd like to search the text word by word. But that's only possible after having someone typing out all of these documents by hand. And that's really happening a lot. It's called transcribing. Imagine the extraordinary amount of work. But luckily computers can lend us a hand these days. Hmm, that's interesting. Because of major breakthroughs in the field of artificial intelligence, computers can now train themselves to become very good at something in particular. But how does it work with transcriptions? Well, first you'll transcribe a couple of pages by hand, feed this to the computer that will then start practicing on it. It will check, adjust and improve itself over and over again until the model that is created is good enough. Using this model, the computer can now read other documents in this handwriting that it has never seen before, whether it's 100 or 100,000 pages. Finally, you put it online, and from then, you can search the full text word by word. Handy! <laughs> so, thanks a lot. I think that's really great. Rick, are you here in the room? Yeah, so here he is the guy who did the video. <laughs> Just by fun. Okay. When I see your faces, I know that um, you are really representing these four groups which we had in mind that we want to provide services from the very beginning. And this slide is really old. But it's still what we would like to do, that we provide services for archives, for libraries, for humanities scholars, for the public, 
and also computer scientists and technology providers. And so that's how we understand ourselves. And of course, we want to support all these groups. They have, of course, also different needs and need uh, different tools. But that's what we would really like to do. Last uh, conference in Vienna, a bit more than a year ago, we asked you uh, to answer some questions and we got uh, very interesting answers from you or from some who attended this conference a year ago. How has working with Transcribus impacted your professional and your scholarly activity? It has convinced me that it is workable and not va pour va. So yes, you can really work and we see it every day. It is... Um, it is possible to do something useful with it. Greatly, my most interesting job and my first funded project, which I'm now starting, would not have been possible without it. So I hope that the project was a success. Um, but this is uh, indeed, uh, Transcribus is used in many project applications and, um, and uh, the project design can be changed if this technology is uh, used could do things that were not possible some years ago. Yes, definitely. Expect it will affect my profession in the future dramatically. Yeah, I mean, we have to admit that, of course, at the universities, many people are still working in a traditional way and are sometimes the promises made by digital humanities papers or digital humanities representatives are maybe a bit too much. If we see it on the longer term, it is by sure that it will change the way humanities are done at the universities and research institutions. Gave our department the ability to start a whole new project. Wouldn't have started my digital edition without transcribers and groundbreaking. And I again have to emphasize that this technology is coming from several research groups in Europe. It has been mainly developed by research groups from uh, Valencia, from Rostock, there are others in Europe. So it's really great to see this input coming from universities to uh, a service platform. I had a quick look um, what happened a week ago, more or less, a bit uh, more than a week ago, just a, a usual day in uh, Transcribus. So 11 models were trained by users within Transcribus, or the, the training finished on this day. The languages used for these models were Arabic, Danish, French, German, Latin, Syriac, and Tibetan. All in all, more than 2 million words were the basis for these models, the ground truth. There was one very big model which finished at that day, so that is not representative, of course, to get a model with 1.7 million words every day. That's, <laughs> that's not the case. It came from a large national, national archive. But the rest are still more than 300,000 words. So if we count 150 words per page or 200 words per page or whatever, you come to something between 1,500 and 2,000 pages, which were the basis for ground truth just at this day. And as you know, creating ground truth is, is expensive and you can always hear from uh, computer scientists and people working with data science and with uh, artificial intelligence and all this uh, nice stuff that ground truth is the real value. And, and, and we are every day surprised that uh, you are producing really so much uh, data, so much uh, reliable ground truth for training the models and uh, that's uh, really one of the, the outstanding features of the Transcribus platform. So I, I assume that uh, within Transcribus you will find the largest ground truth collection for historical documents worldwide, for old historical documents. Of course, uh, if you go to the industry, Google, Microsoft, other providers have much larger collections for modern handwriting. But uh, for historical handwritings, I'm rather sure that, that this is the largest collection. Yeah, the next step is, of course, from an established platform to an economically viable entity. And this is 
definitely new something for us. So I, I have some experience with projects on the academic level, but uh, to, to make a startup is uh, something new and um, it will be interesting to see where this journey will lead us. It is um, five years ago that um, I wrote together, of course, with uh, the others in the REIT project, the proposal for the REIT project. And, and, and we had to explain a business model and uh, there I was writing about the governance model. And I wrote already that it would be interesting because the concept of gathering the data centrally was already in our heads and was already our plan that it would be an interesting idea to set up a cooperative society. And there are millions of people actually in Europe part of a cooperative. So Raiffeisen is very well known or um, uh, many cooperatives are there in the agricultural sector or in the bank sector or um, uh, nowadays in energy. Um, so it's, it's a well-known uh, well-known um, legal governance model, but uh, when we tried to, um, to convince our university, it was not that easy actually, but finally we succeeded and it was possible to set up this legal entity on the first day after the end of the project on the 1st of July. Then we had and still are struggling with uh, bureaucracy and administrative issues, so the real operational start is, uh, is now more or less, so we got our tax number, which is of course very important, um, just uh, a week before Christmas. The main idea of a cooperative is that in many cases it is more efficient and will especially for the long term, bring better results if institutions and people are collaborating. And uh, therefore, um, cooperatives uh, are on the one hand profit oriented, but the profit is for the members and the, the member has to benefit directly from, from a cooperative. I believe that it is a really strong model, a really strong tool, which um, will hopefully bring good results in the mid and long term. So we are really excited to start this and on the 1st of February, the first um, two um, team members joined this uh, legal entity. So part of the team is still working at the university, parts of the team are now working in the COPE and uh, uh, Andy, who is the managing director, will uh, talk more about it and I'm also very happy that Melissa Terras is uh, the third head in our, in our board of directors and uh, we three want to um, hope that we can uh, run this group. Yeah, so I hope that you will join the ride and um, the next speaker will be Andy Stauder. He will um, introduce you um, or give you more details on uh, uh, the future of uh, Transcribus. Thank you. So, hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Transcribus. Uh, I'm here to tell you a story about Transcribus today and it's called After the Grant because as Gunther already said, uh, the EU project during which uh, Transcribus has been largely developed has ended and yeah, we need to maintain the team and the technology and so on. So we needed to find a model for doing that even after the, the end of the project. What to expect from this story? At first I'm going to talk a little bit about where Transcribus comes from, when and where it was developed. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology. So what can Transcribus even do? Because probably many of you here today are already familiar with most of the things uh, that Transcribus can do. But as I heard, uh, there are also many newcomers today. 
or people that aren't that familiar with transcribus yet. So I'll try to talk a little bit about what transcribus is about anyway. And yeah, the third part then is about uh, the future of transcribus or a little bit about the state it is in right now. So economically and also in terms of the user base uh, and what it's hopefully going to be uh, in the future. So let's dive right in. Well, the development of Transcribus began during the Transcriptorium project, which ran from 2013 to 2015. So it was a three-year project as well. And the Read project that probably more among you are familiar with. And this was also a three-year project. And the three main goals of these projects I've listed at the bottom here. They were enhancing HDR technology, obviously, because that's what Transcribus does mainly. And this was done by yeah, conducting research into pattern recognition, machine learning, computer vision, so all the stuff that you need to yeah, recognize handwriting. Uh, another important goal was networking. Uh, this was done by hosting sci scientific uh, competitions, workshops, providing support to users and so on, so to build up the network and uh, the user base also. Uh, and this brings me to the third and probably most important uh, item here, which is bringing HDR technology to the users. So giving ordinary people uh, who aren't technicians uh, of some sort uh, a, uh, an opportunity to train neural technology themselves, so to train models and to use this new powerful AI that we have to, uh, nowadays for recognizing handwriting. And eventually then uh, we uh, built uh, or tried to build at least a service platform through which this can be done and that is essentially Transcribus. Yeah, so let's talk about the technology. What does Transcribus do? The base technology is line-based neural text recognition. So it's not only handwritten text recognition, it's text recognition in general. You can also use, use it for printed material. But why line-based? I brought this example along. You can see for lettery things, I'd call them here, you're not really sure what they are if you don't have any context. And that's the same for a machine. So if it doesn't have any context, which is the line, then it's hard to decide which uh, letter you're dealing with at a uh, particular moment. And if you see the whole word, then it all becomes clear, at least if you speak German. Uh, this is a, because this is a German word, Veranstaltung, which means event, like the Transcribus User Conference. Uh, and in context, the letters are really easy to, to recognize, as long as you speak the language. And it works basically the same way for the machine as well. So Transcribus takes whole lines and deciphers them using context and thus being able to recognize the text uh, without just looking at individual letters, which aren't much to go on. So, and the prerequisite for that is that you get lines at first because at first you need to figure out where's my line, where's the line that I'm trying to decipher. And this is done by AI or machine learning. Uh, and we trained a very large model for line recognition, which is able to do this. You get a page that doesn't have to look very nice necessarily from a yeah, scanning point of view. And Transcribus neatly finds almost all the lines uh, pretty well. Then comes the recognition itself. Here I brought a few examples of handwritten text recognition here. This one's from the 18th century, German, and it's just one hand, so the results are pretty good. Here you can see the words that contained errors, and the errors were mostly minor, so what you get is almost clean text. Uh, this page, for example, has a, an error rate of about 2%. So if you've got one hand and you've got a couple of hundreds, hundreds of pages of ground truth, you can expect to yeah, land somewhere between 2 to 5% maybe character error rate, depending on the script, of course, and the hand. But as I said, it works for printed text as well. Here we've got a newspaper scan. The material is from the early 18th century as well, and it's a German Gothic script, which is hard to read for modern OCR, but not for transcribers. Even with uh, scans of this quality, it 
yields very good recognition rates. Here, for example, the error rate is below 1%, almost half a percent. And another very interesting feature is uh, trainable structure detection, because once you've got the lines figured out and the text contained therein, uh, you're maybe interested in the structure of the page, because a page is a very complex thing, or it can be at least. It gets, it's got a heading, a page number, it's got the running texts, uh, marginals, marginalia, and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is a type of information itself, it's it being structured. And this can also be trained in transcribers. For example, here we have a filing card, and you might be interested for a series of filing cards to find the family name field, as in this case, the thing that's circled in red. And transcribers can do this. You can train it to find a specific structure element in a whole series of images, or in this case, filing cards. And one of the most magical things about transcribers is this technology called keyword spotting, which enables you to find words even if they haven't been recognized correctly using all the information that transcribers outputs in the background. So you do not only get the full text, but in the background, transcribers produces lots and lots of information that you as a normal user don't even see. And this enables us to find words even if they basically look like this. This marked word here, Moivesheikner or whatever Transcribers was thinking here, is actually the name Mitalena, as you can see in the handwriting in the image. This was the German word that the user was looking for here, and with the keyword spotting they were able to find it, even if you would have never found it uh, in plain full text, not even using fuzzy search technology, because it maybe it shares like two or three letters with the, with the whole word. Let's take a brief detour from transcribers because something that's very important is before you start recognizing uh, handwriting, you need to have images. So in the beginning was the image, and for that you can use the scan tent. You can find out more about it here, and what it is is basically a tent that you put on your desk, and you can use your smartphone to scan archival documents, for example, if you're in an archive, and upload the images directly to transcribers and recognize them there. So this is also a very important component. And now let's move on to the, the third part of the story of Transcribers. And I had it this sharing is caring and together we are strong. I couldn't make up my mind which one was better because they're both true. Uh, because this is exactly what uh, Read Co-op is about sharing and, and doing things together in order to do them better or to be able to achieve them uh, at all. And this means what's one of the most important things for us is the user base, because there are many, many power users who spend hundreds and thousands of hours uh, using transcribers to produce ground truth, or just to work, work with the material. And this means user power in turn. So this is basically one part, or one very important cornerstone of, of the whole transcribers program platform so to speak. And yeah, let me just give you a few numbers and figures. As of now, we have around uh, 32,000 users. 200 to 400 of them work with Transcribers daily, and about 1,000 per week, 1,000 unique users. They have trained um, by now about 4,000 models, and this using almost 9 million images, which is really a lot. And the most staggering part that uh, Günther already talked about is the sheer amount of ground truth that's in the platform right now. This is a total of 400,000 pages, so almost half a million pages that have been either manually typed or at least corrected after a first run. And they, if you value them at 20 euros per page, which isn't even that much, uh, this converts to about 8 million euros worth of ground truth in the platform, and this is really staggering. Or if you convert it to uh, work time, it would be about 200 years of uh, one person uh, working on this, 200 person years. Yeah, and this just shows uh, how huge the interest really is in the platform and in the technology. And we get daily requests from universities, archives, family researchers from all over the world. And to make this even easier and more collaborative, uh, we are coming to the web in the future. But unfortunately, I can't tell you really that much about that today because it's still all work in progress, but it's something to look forward to. And this graph shows the development in graphical form. 
here you can see the user numbers and we've been able to almost double them every year since the beginning basically. So at the end we have the 32,000 users here. And at the beginning it was like a thousand or something. The huge transition that uh, we're in the middle of right now is uh, the transition from a uh, project organization, you could call it, to uh, an, yeah, a company basically. And I wrote a kind of business because business is not what we are mainly doing, uh, as I'll explain in a moment. So what's this European cooperative called Read Coop about? It follows the motto of Friedrich Wilhelm Raiffeisen, basically. He was a social reformer, and one of his ideas was that what one cannot do alone, many can do together. That is to, to work towards a common goal and to thus even make possible to achieve this goal. And uh, Reed Corp is such a cooperative, a European one, which is supposed to uh, make bureaucratic stuff within the EU easier. Uh, it's supposed to, <laughs> Ginter is laughing already because, <laughs> yeah, there's still a lot of red tape and a lot of bureaucratic hurdles, but I'll talk about that in a moment a little more. One of the advantages of a co-op is that you can take on members very easily. You don't need to change the, the basic contract of the company, as for example with an LLC. So you don't need to go to a lawyer, a notary and so on whenever you want to take on a new member. Uh, members can join very easily and we also set uh, the, the price relatively low so almost everybody should be able to do it if they want because you can start buying one share which is 250 euros and there's a four share minimum for organizations to balance it out a little bit between private people and organizations so we don't want anyone to be too powerful on their own within the organization. And one share as a private person gets you one vote and four shares get you one, one vote uh, as an organization. And 25% of the amount of the shares that you bought, that's your annual member membership fee. So if you buy, bought one share, it's like 60 euros, so uh, nothing really. Also, it's very democratic. We've got the board of directors, as Günther uh, already mentioned. That's uh, Günther, Melissa and me and the General Assembly the, that meets annually, which consists of all the members of the co-op, where you can vote, elect the, the directors, uh, vote on the decisions that we're taking, and so on. And the main goal of a cooperative is really the direct benefits to the members, and these benefits uh, with Read Co-op are mainly discounts on the pages that you buy, so if you're a member, it's a lot cheaper. You can also buy them if you're not a member or if you can't be a member for yeah, uh, administrative reasons, which is sometimes the case. Uh, but if you're a member, it gets a lot more affordable. Transparency, you're part of the company. You have a right to know basically anything that goes on within the company. You've got a right to vote, as I said. Uh, that means you can fun shape uh, the future of the company as well because you can elect the directors, you can vote on the decisions and so on, so you can sort of be part of it. And uh, one very interesting thing, uh, especially for organizations, is that you can do funding rounds. So you can co-fund, for example, new features within Transcribers. For example, imagine you have a feature that costs about 100,000 euros to program. If there's 20 members that need this feature, it's a, a really minor amount that you need to spend and you can get around uh, having to do the whole song and dance of a public tender, which you would have to do if it was if it was 100,000 euros. Even if you had access to the money, you would probably be obligated to put it out to a competitive tender. And yeah, as I said, we don't want any single one uh, to be too powerful within the organization. Um, and this is made possible uh, by... Uh, share cap, you can't buy more than 20 shares in the co-op. And uh, this distributed ownership is also ideal for data sharing because you're not sharing your data with some company in another country which you have no control over, but you're sharing it with your own company basically, with the company that you're part of. Because in, in essence, with a co-op, customers are owners and owners are customers. And this is a, a really beautiful thing, I think. Yeah, this is a picture of the founding meeting of the four founding members. Uh, the meeting took place, as Günther said, uh, on the 1st of July last year. 
And until we were fully operational, it took us like half a year. We had expected it to be a couple of weeks, but it ended up to be a half a year. Uh, it was a really long and winding road, courtesy of yeah, Austrian and European bureaucracy. So uh, it wasn't uh, yeah, basically any one person's fault or anything. And another thing is we did it in the middle of summer. So if you want to start a company, take my advice. Don't do it in the middle of summer because everybody's going to be on holiday and everything's going to take twice as long than it normally, as it normally would. But uh, we had a lot of uh, wind underneath our wings because uh, there were already lots of institutions and also private people that wanted to apply for membership. And this really gave us the, the strength to power through this bureaucratic uh, marathon. So nothing comes from nothing, as all of you are aware. So we need to talk pricing a little. This is, I guess, very interesting to many of you because you're going to want to know what Transcribers is going to cost you in the future and how you're going to manage uh, to find that money. It fits on one sheet of paper, basically. So we tried to build a, a relatively straightforward pricing model. The prices will be somewhere in the range between 22 and 13 euro cents, depending on how many pages you buy, whether you're a member or not. These are the standard prices. And then there will be custom pricing, of course, for very large orders or for additional services. So if you need lots and lots of support for a project, if you need uh, help with generating the ground truth, if you have a couple of million pages or so on, then of course we need to tailor this to the specific uh, contract. But for the regular payment, there are two models. One is a prepaid model. You've got five uh, price tiers or package sizes, so depending on the package size of pages that you buy, that's what the price depends on. The larger the package, the lower the price. And members uh, get a 10% discount on this uh, price. And the other option is an annual subscription, which is basically the same. The only difference is it's recurring. That means you commit to buying the same amount of pages the following year as well which might also be very interesting to institutions because they often can uh, conclude such uh, ongoing or continuous contracts and you don't have to apply for the money uh, every year again. And if you are a member and you uh, take out a subscription, then you get an additional discount. Uh, that is, you don't just add the 10 plus 10 percent, but you get 25 percent off. So it really pays off for members. So being a member, yeah makes the whole thing a lot more affordable. And you can buy additional non-subscription packages at any time, of course, so you're not sort of, um, yeah, locked in by this subscription. You can buy more pages any time you want as a regular package. The prices you can see uh, here on the right, these are without the discounts, so these are the base prices depending on how many pages you buy, and everybody gets 250 pages for free when they sign up. Everybody likes freebies, and we like to keep transcribers free, at least to some extent. So uh, we really are thrilled about our community, and we, of course, also want to give something back. And what's also going, or what's really going to remain free is storage and uh, training, uh, which all of this uh, means costs for us in terms of the infrastructure, and for you as well, if you are a member. Uh, because you need uh, servers to run the whole thing on. And uh, this is going to rem remain free, but there will be a deferrable auto-delete feature. That means you get a warning. Uh, look, you haven't touched this collection in three months. We're going to move it to the archive. There it's going to st stay for another nine months. You'll get a uh, warning before the end of that as well, and then it's deleted. So you can postpone this as many times as you want, but we don't want stuff to just be lying around with nobody even being interested in it and it blocking up space and resources for other users. And we are hoping to start with the payment models uh, in June. But yeah, it might be a bit later, it might be a bit earlier, but that's the very rough time frame. And all of this is, of course, subject to change. So this is the first draft that we're going to use for the payment model. 
of transcribers and we'll of course also we are happy about any feedback that you can give then as users and we'll take a close look at the numbers and we'll try to make it work for for everybody and yeah these funds of course mean that we can do a lot of things and that we can keep transcribers alive and here are the things that we've been able to do with the larger projects that we've already started working on in the background with a couple of larger partners and clients which have kept us afloat in the few months up until now after the end of the project and I'm happy to say that we could keep on uh, the whole Transcribers team and even extend it because the work is getting more as well. With the more users you have, the more work it means, of course. We have been able to keep Transcribers alive, the most important thing, keep the technical infrastructure running, uh, also keep improving Transcribers and adding new features, and keep uh, HDR available to everyone. So this uh, the, the thing that I said earlier that we want to make it available to almost anyone who has a computer basically and keep transcribers free sort of at least so at least there's the 250 free pages and the free storage and also we've been able to keep organizing a transcribers user conference and I think the family photo is maybe going to be a bit bigger this year I hope it's coming out that nice as well and I hope everybody is going to be in it. I don't know how we organized this anyway. You'll get details on that later. And yeah, you'll also know uh, when to run away if you don't want to be in the photo. So that's it from me. And if you want to be part of it all, then you can find out more at the, these addresses. And if you want to join, I don't know, can you read it? As I tried to really make you see that we want you to join, because that's basically the most important thing for us right now, to get as many members as possible. Um, yeah, and to keep the whole thing going. Yeah, I hope it's been an interesting story, and now you know a bit more about Transcribers and what it's all about and what you can be part of. Thank you.